Hi YouTube, this is Joe Calton with Calton Cutlery. You can find me on the web, CaltonCutlery.com. Alright, so we're going to continue this, uh, um, this making a new knife pattern uh, series. Um, where we're at now was the last video was pattern making. Okay, so we have our pattern now. And the, uh, actually, let's let's kind of do a, a quick review. Okay, so this was this the whole idea of this pattern is that I normally, you know, I mean, I make a whole bunch of these these Carter pattern neckers, right? And I make them to where you can carry them as a necker, but I don't normally personally carry a necker. Um, I carry a necker when I'm kayaking. I carry a necker when I'm uh, uh, doing a project where I'm going through edges right and left, and I need a, you know, an extra edge. Uh, like let's say I'm putting up a whole bunch of insulation or something like that and you're just going through edge after edge, you know. That way you got an extra quick edge, you throw it around your neck. Use that one first. When it dulls up, you pull it off, stick it in your pocket, start going with your other edges, right? <coughs> but I do normally carry one of these neckers um, as a belt knife. Which I can't remember. Well, you should be able to see that from there. Yeah. You can see the top of the bench. You normally carry one as a belt knife. Pretty much the way you do that is you take, you know, you take the neck cord off, and then this was a, a, an older design that had the solid rivets, and you take your hollow kydex rivets and you run the uh, the cord through those rivets, making a belt loop. Okay, really like carrying this this style of knife that way. So I thought, you know what? Let's go ahead and do a video on how you start off with an idea and then go all the way through to a completed batch of knives, one of which is going to be a prototype. I'll carry it for, I don't know, until I decide that I want to carry something else, and then sell the rest of them. <coughs> so anyway, so what we did was we took um, things that I liked from the last couple of patterns um, and changed them around a little bit to come up... Hey, hey! Hush. Um, to come up with this pattern right here. Uh, anyway, so, um, and this pattern right here is a combination. Hey, y'all go lay down. Come on, go lay down. I'm shooting a video. This pattern right here is a combination of Murray Carter's uh, original, original model neck knife um, and changes that I've made to that over the years to make it my perfect neck knife design and then we took that and we enlarged it a little bit to make it my perfect belt city city belt knife design I guess or maybe a city fixed blade EDC or something uh, maybe there's an acronym in there that we can use for a name but <clears throat> anyway so this is what we've got right now now today I went to the post office to mail a knife and um, I got a letter and so I needed to open it, and I had completely forgotten that I had kept one of those, uh, I call them wherever knives. I made a batch of these a while back, and they're pretty much um, Murray's original model neck knife. Pretty dang close, okay? Um, for me, you know, that's too big for a neck knife. And so what I did was... Um, I sold that, that batch, uh, I called them wherever knives. They had uh, solid kydex rivets in there. So the idea was that you would lash this to a shoulder strap on your, your backpack or uh, to a life vest or you know pretty much anywhere you needed a spare edge. But anyhow, this is mighty close to the size that we came up with here. It's a little bit smaller. But mighty dang close. So now, this will give me a pretty good idea about what the handle is going to feel like when I get a when we get to the point where we're putting a handle on this. And I think it's going to be just about right. We may end up shortening this, oh, by an eighth inch or so. But I think other than that, we're pretty dang close to where I'm after. <coughs> so today, or what this video is going to be, um, we need to go from this pattern to a blank. All right, so like, uh, you know, a heat-treated 
uh, blade that's ready to uh, start grinding and finishing out. Um, and in this series, I'm giving you a whole bunch of stuff that honestly I found lacking in a whole bunch of other how-to videos on knife making. You know, everybody said this is how you cut out and everything, and they would they would jump from you know, a piece of steel, they'd show you laying out the pattern, show you a little bit of cutting it out, and then jump to it cut out and ground and everything. But a lot of the stuff I thought was kind of glazed over, and um, I'm hoping to kind of address an awful lot in there. So right now, our next decision is uh, steel type and steel thicknesses and the way we're going to make the knife, okay? <clears throat> um, so the steel on this one is going to be 1095. I like 1095 because I'm kind of a, you know, I hate to use the term old school because everybody throws that around an awful lot, but I like things that have been out for a while and they've had time to be tested through the marketplace um, and through use, okay? So 1095 steel has been with us a long, long time. They're still manufacturing 1095 steel. It's readily available. You can get it in several different thicknesses. Um, it starts getting kind of tough to get in, as far as I've seen, in thicknesses over about 3 16ths of an inch, okay? But 3 16ths of an inch all the way down to, um, I think you can get it as uh, strip steel from McMaster Car down to like 40 thousandths of an inch thick, um, <clears throat> which I haven't played with any of that, but you know, you can get it in a good variety of thicknesses that are suitable to making knives. My two best suppliers that I've gotten from ten, gotten 1095 from have been Jantz um, Knife Making Supply Company. Um, if you're just doing like a small order or something, you know, where you just need a half a dozen or, you know, maybe 10 sticks, um, sticks being an inch and a half, two inches wide, whatever thickness and 36, I think Jantz sells them in 36 inch lengths. Um, or 18 inch length. So if you just need enough to make one knife or if you need enough to make, you know, <clears throat> a batch of maybe a dozen knives, you know, that's a good place to get. Get the get 1095. If you want more steel or you want to buy in bulk, um, I've been having really good luck with Admiral Steel. I buy this stuff in um, it's either three or four foot wide sheets that are I want to say eight foot long. And then they cut them in half yeah, that looks like about a four foot uh, piece right there. So yeah, eight foot long, and they cut them in half to make it easier on the UPS guy. They come in um, uh, sandwich type pallets, uh, so a really nice big box. <coughs> um, and it's been really good clean steel for me. I've gone through, I don't know, maybe half a dozen of those sheets in uh, 16th of an inch and 3 seconds of an inch. Um, and, you know, I haven't had any problems with any of it from Admiral. Jantz, same thing, except for I've been through quite a few of their sticks because, you know, it's such small pieces. I mean, even if you order, you know, say a dozen sticks, well, that's still not really a whole lot of steel. <clears throat> so anyway, so, uh, but anyway, 1095. Um, so it's available in the thicknesses, um, you know, and sizes suitable for knife making, you know, really easily. Um, if you heat treat it right, which I suppose you really shouldn't have to say that because, I mean, any steel, if you heat treat it right, will probably be a good performer for you, right? The problem is, is when you don't heat treat it right, you're not getting everything out of the steel. But that's not the steel's fault, that's the heat treat's fault um, or the nut behind the heat treat, you know. But 1095... I find to be uh, a very, very good performing steel um, that is not too costly to heat treat, um, although I do use a multiple quench and I cycle the crap out of it before I heat treat it, um, which does take time, but that's not really man hours, that's hit the button on the kiln and walk away until the next day sort of deal. And we'll get that get to that in, when we start doing the heat treating. Um, you've got okay flexible strength with 1095 um, until you get into to fairly thin blades. Once you get real thin then you get an awful lot more flexibility. Um, 
if you do like extreme uh, heat treating, so like if you're going to, you know, really after flexible strength and you only do an edge, a very shallow edge quench, then you can get in a, a very thin grind, then you can get a lot of flexible strength out of 1095. Um, but in like a, a 330 seconds stock, um, you know, with a, a medium grind, say 10,000 stick at the shoulder of the edge, 330 seconds at the spine, and you know, 25, 30 thousandths, you know, a quarter inch back from the edge, you get a usable level of flexible strength um, that's not bad, but it's not, I mean, it'll never be anything like 5160 or 52100 or um, even 1095 and 15 and 20. But it's a very reasonable price steel, very simple and, um, um, you know, pleasant to work with. And I go through a ton of it. And, you know, most of the folks that buy my 1095, um, I've actually had, I don't know how many times I've had somebody call me up, email me, text, <clears throat> you know, whatever, saying, hey, I bought this knife from you, and it's out of 1095, and there is no way that this is 1095. And I say, well, you know, I'm, uh, I'm sorry you feel that way, but, you know, when I ordered it from the supplier, I ordered 1095. When it came from the supplier, it came with either a sticker on it or a data sheet saying that it was 1095. And it works like the other, rest of the 1095 that I've worked from the suppliers that I've liked. Uh, I have every reason to believe that it is 1095. <clears throat> well, then that person will say, well, I've got 10 other knives made out of 1095, and this one will cut circles around every single one of those. So this can't be 1095. Well, you know, like I said, proper heat treat, um, you know, takes some homework and... Um, uh, and it, it takes time. So there is a lot of really good 1095 out there, but seeing as how 1095 is a fairly inexpensive steel, there's also a lot of subpar 1095 out there. And I've run into quite a bit of it, um, you know, in, in production knives and in some, uh, you know, customs. But anyways, I really love this stuff. So that's what we're going to make this out of. Now, so our next decision is going to be, do we forge it? Or do we um, just do a stock removal? Okay, so um, and you can forge 1095, or you can buy it in sheet stock. You know, either way. Um, most of my, with the exception of straight razors, most of my 1095 knives are stock removal. Okay, um, the reason for that is because, like I said, you can get it in whatever thickness that you want already rolled out from the mill, okay? Now, the um, the thing about the forge blade versus the stock removal blade um, and how the forge blade is, you know, somehow better than the stock removal blade, uh, that's going to be a topic for a whole nother video. And one of these days I will shoot that video. As of right now, what I'm going to tell you on that is that me personally, any time I've taken a, no, let's, let's back that up because there's going to be a whole bunch of people that sits, that, that listens to this part and they'll be like, well, hey, well, what about this? And hey, what about that? So I heard Ty Gu one time, um, he's another knife maker, he said, that he believed that the forge blade had the potential to be a better blade than the stock removal blade. But there's a whole lot of places that you can screw it up. And I will agree with that. <clears throat> I think that if you start with a large piece of steel, no, I say this, but not quite. I mean, you know, one inch round or larger, and you forge that steel out under controlled temperatures um, controlled timing, you know, and in a methodical manner, that the number of heat cycles that you put that steel through until it gets to be a blade has a tendency to refine the grain and sort of undo the damage that the mill caused when they rolled it out, okay? 
So basically when the mill, you know, they get a, a block of steel, right? Okay, from the foundry. And then they will roll that, that steel out to get sheet stock, okay? Everybody knows that the hotter the steel is, the easier it is to work, right? The easier it is to work, the less wear and tear on your equipment, all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> so it would make sense that they would run it at the upper end of the temperature that is safe for the steel just to make it easier on their equipment and stuff, right? I mean, that's just the way it is, you know, I mean, efficiency, okay? So when you start getting into, um, you know, sheet stock, I think that the biggest difference between the forge blade and the stock removal blade isn't so much the hammering effect, but I do believe you get a little bit of, of benefit there, but it's the heat cycles at controlled heat, heating and cooling that's, that makes the forge blade have the greater potential than the straight up stock removal blade, right? Which is why I cycle the crap out of this stuff before we go into heat treat. <clears throat> so, for a video like this, we're going to go with uh, stock removal, okay? Um, because that's what I do most of my 1095 with is stock removal. So now our next choice <coughs> is going to be um, <clears throat> what thickness? Um, now remember I told you my neck knives... You know, I try to keep them, now this one was a, a forged uh, pattern welded one, so um, it, you know, the thickness will be run slightly thicker on these. But on a normal um, neck knife, yeah, this one, 1095, um, I make these out of 16th inch thick stock, and then I put a very lean grind on them, you know, to get most of the weight out, um, while still maintaining a usable level of strength. And sixteenth of an inch is fine for me for that neck knife and that class of knife. <clears throat> also, in this part right here, this part of this decision-making process, there's not really any right or wrong answer. Um, not until you get into extremes, okay? I mean, if you were to take a knife this size and say, okay, well, I want to make that at a quarter-inch thick stock and then make it a neck knife, I would have to say that's a little bit on the extreme side. I mean, first of all, that's... Um, four times as thick as this is? No. Sixteenths. One sixteenths. So that would be that would be eight times as thick as this is, right? This, no, that'd be a half inch. Yeah, four times thicker than this, right? In a blade that's that size, there is no way that you could break quarter inch thick 1095 that's been properly heat treated in a knife that size by hand. There, I mean, you, you just couldn't do it. If the spine was left full thickness, even if you were to jam that into a, a vise or a crevice or something and do pull-ups on that thing, you would not break it, right? And then that would be like a boat anchor hanging around your neck all day, you know? <clears throat> so I would say in that case, that might be a little bit on the extreme, maybe slightly wrong side. I mean, you know, if you wanted to use that term. But, <clears throat> um, but the right or wrong thing, you know, not really, okay? I mean, you just... you build the knife to do what you want it to do, you know, I mean, um, and there's nothing right or wrong with either, any one of those. Like I said, this is going to be a knife for my personal use, and then I'll build more of them to sell also, but I'll build it as if I was building it for myself. So, 16th inch stock, um, you know, that's fine on that size of knife. Uh, if we didn't take the grind all the way full height, and we took it up maybe two-thirds or maybe three-quarters of the way, you know, I think it would be okay with, uh, with a knife that size. This particular one right here, the wherever knife, it was made out of 3 seconds thick stock. And it does feel like it'd be too heavy for a neck knife. But, you know, it doesn't feel too bad for, for a, um, a belt knife, just the way it is. It feels a little bit butt-heavy. Um, You know what we might do is we might just go ahead and make half and half. Uh, I think we're going to make six of these, so let's make six of these and one sixteenth inch stock, and six of them, or no, three of them and one sixteenth, and three of them and three thirty seconds. <coughs> Play with both of them and find out. I don't think that um, one sixteenth would be too thin for a knife this size. 
Um, but then again, if uh, you know, if somebody was to use, want to use a belt knife more for you know the whole batoning thing, which I hate so much, um, unless it's a knife that's that's designed to do that. But those guys that are trying to split a four-inch log with a Swiss Army knife by pounding through it with a log, yeah, not so good. Um, yeah, so we'll just do we'll just do three of them in sixteenth, and three of them in three thirty seconds. Um, and honestly, I'm not too sure. Maybe we'll do, yeah, we'll do a light version and a heavy version. So a light EDC and a heavy EDC of whatever um, whatever name we end up coming with, <clears throat> coming up with. So, <clears throat> so we have our steel type figured out. We have our steel size figured out. We have our pattern made. And we're not going to make all this out of uh, out of these patterns right here. It's just that um, you know we're we're trying to fill up the kiln right now for uh, a batch of 1095. I hate firing up the kiln honestly for you know two or three or even ten knives. You know, I mean, if I'm going to uh, spend the amount of power that it takes to to fire that kiln up and cycle steel, I want that kiln to be pretty much as full as it can be. Um, not only does that spread your time in heat cycling and heat treating out, but it also uh, spreads your costs for the electricity to run it out. Um, and then uh, I also believe you get a little bit better heat cycling because you have more mass inside the kiln to retain heat as you go through each one of the cycles. Okay, so <clears throat> let's see who that was. Uh, no big deal. Okay, so what we have is here is a scrap of 1095. Now this is going to um, go pretty much just like the pattern, you know, making the pattern did. All right. And these knives right here don't have anything like special about them. Okay, so like when you're making chef's knives, um, and you go to lay those out, and you're cutting them out on a um, you know, a little porta band like what I use. <clears throat> a lot of times it's best to think about how you're going to make that cut right there, you know, before you draw the pattern out. Because if you draw the pattern out backwards, then the throat on the, the cut of the bandsaw doesn't have enough space. And so you end up kind of cutting from here and cutting from here and flipping it over and trying to match up the cuts in between. This knife right here doesn't really have that problem. So, what we're going to do, actually, let's bring you over here closer. Let's get you right in close. Maybe, actually, let's see if I can work around you here. Uh, okay, so we got the blade, or the, the pattern clamped up. Let's go ahead and... This is a carbide tip scribe. Um, can't remember if I got this one from Jantz. I mean, they sell them, or if I got them from uh, got it from Home Depot. Okay, scribe our holes for our pins, and we only get one there. And we'll probably just go ahead and cut this cut this one out and get it ready and then uh, I'm not going to make you <coughs> make you watch me cut all of them out cuz that'd take a, you know that'd be boring right now when you um You know, all these scraps, these cutoffs that you're going to get. In fact, this one right here, this piece was a, uh, a scrap piece. Um, kind of hard telling what it was, what it was from. You know, what I was making when I originally cut it out. Um, save all your scraps. You know, because you can make, <clears throat> well, I mean, within reason. You know, you can make pocket knives out of the scraps, you can make um, uh, little chisels, wood carving tools, uh, pocket knives, you know, all kind of stuff out of your scraps. 
And then the, the really little itty bitty scraps, you know, you think you got scraps that's, that's too small, you know, like these little pieces that are going to be in here. You know, you'd think that, hey, that's, that's too small. You couldn't make nothing out of that. Well, heck, save them anyway, because if you forge, um, <clears throat> you can always, uh, you know, stick them into a can and uh, as filler when you make uh, canned Damascus. Okay. So there we go. We've got three, <coughs> three scribe patterns, three thirty seconds, ten ninety-five. <clears throat> Let me grab my earplugs and some safety glasses, and we'll go over and cut them out. Now on the last one, I put you. I noticed that I put you way way away and you couldn't really see what was going on so this time let's just stick you right up on top of everything like I said this is going to be loud um, I don't know how loud it's going to be so uh, so watch your ears in case it is too loud all right so so let's make this cut first and then we'll come in and make this cut and free this one and then we'll be able to cut from here and over to there Okay, so two things I thought of while we were doing that. One of which, I don't know if I told you guys this before, but while I don't use a push stick very often on a uh, 
bandsaw, or at least this one, I do use a foot switch. Okay, so, um, and like I said, I, on the, the last video when we were cutting out, you know, I brace an awful lot on the sides of the table, right? And I don't know if you noticed it, but, you know, my thumbs and my fingers never even came close to that blade while I was cutting. All right, also, your stance, you know, when you're sitting there or when you're standing there cutting, you know, my balance, um, now this, this particular one, it rocks quite a bit, okay? So a lot of times when you heard that saw kind of die down for a little bit, you know, I have one foot here on the corner of the, um, the stand to kind of hold everything. That's the foot that all my weight is on. This one right here is more for balance and it's operate the foot switch. So as long as my center of balance is back away from that blade and my hands have got a pretty good anchor point, you know, somewhere on the table and I keep my fingers away from everything and it's always nice controlled cuts and I keep fresh blades in here. Honestly, I've never really um, considered it to be all that dangerous of a tool, but you know, your mileage may vary. All right, so, <clears throat> so that piece of scrap right there is gonna go in the scrap bin. These blades right here, um, actually no, we're right over here anyway. Let's go ahead and get these drilled. Or get, at least get one of them drilled. Um, <clears throat> there will be a, a slight amount of, um, you know, like if you were making a folding knife, you definitely would not, you'd want to make sure that you got rid of all your burrs first before you laid it down on the table to, uh, to drill your pinholes. But on something like this, it really isn't going to matter all that much. So what we're going to need is we're going to need two pinholes for our pins. We're going to need a thong tube hole for in those cases where people decide they want to order one that's got a thong tube on it. You want to make sure that there's one in your, your pattern already. And then we're going to drill holes for what I call epoxy rivets. So we've got a number 30 drill bit in here, which is a 0.257, no, 0.253, something like that. It's two, th no, that's a quarter inch, 0 0.12, 0 0.127. It's like two thousandths of an inch larger than an eighth inch diameter bit. Um, we would normally uh, go ahead and, well, actually, no. We'll go ahead and do it that way. I'll show you right quick. Where's my center punch? Or my, uh, you know, my punch thing. Okay. So we are just going to punch um, our two pinholes. And when I get that about centered, Not about centered. That way our drill bit won't walk when we go to drill these two pinholes. Because these two, you can't, well, actually let's go ahead and get that, uh, that lanyard tube one while we're here. Right about there looks good. Okay, now let's drill some holes. <clears throat> Okay, so drilling holes. Like I said, we got that, that drill bit that's slightly over an eighth inch in diameter. Um, I also don't clamp stuff down very often. If I'm drilling a hole that needs to be exactly where it needs to be, you know, um, you know, I might clamp down, but most of the time what I do is put the blade up against uh, the stand here, or I grab a set of long vice grips or long jaw vice grips and you can take those stick those there and that gives you something so if that drill bit catches that blade and it wants to spin it okay it'll stop right there all right so if you're doing something like that always run it right up against you know the piece that you're holding there
Okay, so we have our pinholes and the pilot for our thong tube hole done. So we are done with that drill bit for this particular blade. This is another reason I like doing everything in batches is because um, there's fewer drill bit changes, fewer belt changes. There's more time working and less time setting everything up. Okay, so now what we need to do is we need to countersink these two pinholes, then go ahead and drill this hole completely. This is a uh, uh, letter F, if I remember right. It is uh, It cuts a hole that's just a couple of thousands over a quarter inch, and a quarter inch is uh, the size of my thong tubing. So, see that countersink that it leaves like that? Now, first of all, that makes it really easy to get your pin in there, okay, when you go to put your handle material on. Second of all, that uh, gets rid of any stress risers that might be happening from that sharp edge uh, during heat treat. This one goes all the way through. Okay, so we've got our two pin holes plus our thong tube hole. Now, these next three holes that are going to go in here, these are, they lighten the, the handle up by getting rid of some of the steel because steel is heavier than epoxy or um, uh, wood. And second of all, they give epoxy room to go from this side of the knife to that side of the knife and they make what I call epoxy rivets and they help with the strength of the handle um, construction. And they, and they can be anywhere really. Put one there. I usually do three of these in the neckers. Um, I think there's going to be room for four of them. In, uh, in this one since it's got a larger handle. You just don't want to get... Okay, so those have all been drilled. Now we need to countersink those. What I was trying to say is you just don't want to get too carried away with uh, lightning holes. Um, I mean, I've seen pictures of uh, handles that had so many lightning holes in them that there wasn't really a whole lot of steel left. Um, now, granted, steel is going to be, um, you know, tougher than pretty much any handle material out there. So if you have to make a, a choice between steel or handle material, you know, for weight in the design of the knife, lean more towards less steel and more wood, if wood's what you're using, because the wood is going to be weaker than the steel. So if you have a thicker scale, then you'll have, um, you know, a stronger scale, right? And the steel can be on the thinner side because it's so tough. But, I mean, as a general rule, but, you know, if you get to the point, I mean, see, these have got plenty of steel, you know, all the way around these holes on the outside. You could put these together and make, um, you know, take a, a saw, a jeweler saw, and cut the webbing out there if you wanted to. I think that would be a little bit excessive and kind of time-consuming for, for a knife like this. So now what we need to do is we need to get rid of those burrs. Okay, so there we have our blades scribed, handle pins drilled, uh, epoxy holes and lightning holes and our thong tube hole drilled. So now the next thing to do is going to be to grind it, um, you know, grind our profile. Uh, let's see, we're at 40 minutes. Hmm. 
Let's go ahead and, and uh, cut this one short before we get done with this step. And then, we'll, then I'll go ahead and start another video. We'll grind this and then straighten it, get it ready for heat treat. Um, yeah, we'll split it like that. So, um, again, this is Joe Calton with Calton Cutlery. You can find me on the web, caltoncutlery.com. Hope you enjoyed the video and um, stay tuned for the next one.